So hi everyone, I'm Ranjan and I'm going to talk to you about this tool called Circuitscape. So it's a tool for modeling something called landscape connectivity. So firstly, what is landscape connectivity? So connectivity amongst uh, populations or uh, different individuals in a certain habitat is something that is of interest to ecologists. Now, um, whenever there are uh, several external factors, this sort of connectivity tends to change because animals tend to migrate and understanding and understanding and preserving and possibly restoring this connectivity uh, whenever there are complex landscapes and cons complex interactions is something that ecologists care about. So when you want to model something like this, it's important that your models and the metrics by which you measure these models are reliable, con computationally efficient, and they are process-based. That is, they are rooted in some form of reality. Right Now, uh, there's been a lot of literature um, about what uh, how exactly we can measure all these different models uh, and metrics, but uh, the one that's uh, uh, popular right now is um, <clears throat> is modeling landscapes as sets of resistances. So uh, there are there are other least cost models and um, other kinds of models as well. But the thing about uh, resistances is that uh, there is a direct real world co correlation. Like um, the probability of a movement across a patch is proportional to the is sort of proportional to its conductance. So if there is there is a particular patch of land which has a higher resistance, um, the probability of the animal or the individual moving across that piece of land uh, becomes low. So this directly relates to random walk theory in terms of the animal being a random walker, and uh, sort of affects the probabilities. Uh, of hopping between different nodes in a habitat network, right? So once you model the entire landscape as a set of resistances um, with different nodes, um, you you can now find the path of least resistance, and this, and you can incidentally use this path of least resistant resistance to predict uh, migration patterns of these animals. So pictorially, what I mean is something like this. Um, so if you look at this little chart, uh, what's happening is. Um, as climate change sets in, animals in the United States are moving upward. And uh, this shows all the feasible paths, uh, according to a couple of studies, that mammals, and birds, and amphibians um, are using to find a moose more suitable climate as the climate is uh, warming. Right. Anyway, so, so Circuitscape is, again, just a piece of software that, uh, that takes a couple of inputs. Uh, first input is, a, is something called a habitat file, and another is called um, a point file. So, um, so basically, how exactly do you model the entire landscape, and what are the points of interest in that landscape? So, you can either specify it as a as an edge pair list, like you would a network, or you can specify it as a kind of grid uh, or raster in this case. And there are two ways, uh, two modes of operation. One's called pairwise, wherein you you sort of treat each pair of uh, point of points of interest. You take each pair within that and treat one as a source and another as a sink and then calculate the least resistant path. Or otherwise you can you can specify arbitrary sources and sinks and then calculate the resi least resistance path. So this tool was originally written in Python. It's a, it's a fairly popular tool, so already been written in Python, but um, using mostly SciPy, NumPy, and PyMG, which, uh, and since most of these are implemented in C, C++, most of the work is actually being done uh, within these packages. Um, uh, but the idea is to sort of make this this code scale much better using using uh, a language like Julia and improve speed and scalability, right? Uh, so this is currently I'm impl sorry implementing this as a Julia package and and there's just a simple API uh, now. Uh, you call the compute function on a particular config file, and that would uh, and that would output a particular resistance. Uh, you know the set of resistance grids, as well as a few set of current maps, which indicate how um, uh, indicate the migration patterns. So, how exactly do these current maps look like? In fact, the current maps are probably the most important thing you want to look at. Um, just to give you an example, I've I've calculated a certain current map, and um, if you look at if you look at the map, it looks something like this. So, most you can find that most of these areas are pretty dense, whereas the landscape in these areas. Uh, are not as dense and sort of allow the animals to move around. So this gives you some kind of understanding of how the landscape is in terms of uh, barriers to movement. Right. OK, so computationally speaking, uh, what exactly is Circuitscape doing? So as I said earlier, the input is either an edge pair or a, or a large grid. And each cell within, within this grid, for example, let's talk about a grid, each cell has some resistance values. So what do you do with this? Uh, you, you take all these resistance values and then you construct this large sparse graph 
wherein the resistance between two nodes is, is either the average or some aggregation method between two different nodes, right? Um, and what do you do is after you do that, you sort of take the source and the sink which you have specified, and then um, if you're in pairwise mode, you, you calculate the, um, you, you sort of assign both the source and sink as one ampere, and then you calculate the least resistance path, Otherwise, if you're in advanced mode, you can specify arbitrary numbers of sources of sinks with variable strength. So that, so for you could you could be injecting five amperes of current into the network and and sinking about one ampere. So get depends. So now, once you have this large graph, you now solve the system to find the least resistance path, right? So what exactly does does the matrix you're solving for look like? It's a it's a Laplacian so symmetric positive semi-definite, um, but you, but we obviously make it. Uh, positive definite and use it with our solver, um, or rather the computational techniques are similar. So you can see most of these, most of this area is completely sparse and it's, um, it's sort of banded around this particular region, right? So as, so to make this scalable in, in something like Julia, there are two major modes of improvement. Uh, one is improving the solver and the other is improving the parallelism. Now, actually, if you, if you look at, if you profile the application, most of the time is actually spent uh, in, in the solver and the preconditioner. So uh, let's say about 12 seconds, maybe about seven to eight seconds is spent in this. So what do you do? You, you try and improve the solver, right? So currently we're using uh, algebraic mul uh, multigrade preconditioner with conjugate gradients. Um, but but for, for certain kinds of problem sizes and in certain kinds, kinds of graphs, you can, you can replace that with, uh, with, a with a direct solver, Cholesky decomposition with reduced fill. And um, especially when you have large numbers of corrected components, the time taken to construct the preconditioner could be large, so you can instead just use a direct solver. But for, large, for larger um, sizes where you have a number of nodes, you have a number of pairs within the same connected component, you kind of have you kind of have to do the precondition uh, c construct the preconditioner anyway but then you can spread this uh, spread this cost amongst the different pairs pairs you're trying to solve especially if you're trying to solve solve it in parallel right so this sort of motivates some of the improvements that i'm i'm thinking about um, so so this this for example is a simple comparison of the direct and the iterative solver so this so this blue column everywhere is the is the direct solver and um, this is the um, iterative solver. The pink and the yellow are the iterative solver. And you can find that uh, it's about for around 40% uh, faster. The direct solver is about 40% fa faster up to up till uh, a few millions of nodes. Of course, that's that's going to change. But if you're if you're being smart about how you how and where you construct the preconditioner, you can uh, you can sort of balance this cost. Um, so to so to improve. So that that's that's about improving the solver. Of course, uh, you could all, always look up more solution techniques and perhaps more um, you know graph realignment techniques to improve the solver. Uh, but then the sec the second way you'd want to improve the application is to improve the parallelism. And uh, while improve to improve the parallelism, uh, there are two ways you can sort of think about this. So for each connected component, you can solve each pair uh, in parallel. Right. So you can find uh, a least resi resistance path with each pair in parallel. Or you can you can sort of do it at a point level. So for each point, you'll have a number of pairs. So you sort of parallelize across points and have them serially solve each pair. So so those those are the two ways. And uh, the question then becomes which one do you use? Both of them have advantages and disadvantages. Especially in the pair case, you have to do more broadcast. So if you have um, if if you're if you feel like your matrix is large and you might saturate the fabric uh, bandwidth. This might not be the best possible thing to do, but but in a point level parallelism, you want a point level technique. You're not taking advantage of as much parallelism. Um, but then the question is, which one do you choose? And right now, according to my experiments, it depends. Uh, so one one particular parallel benchmark, I've I've sort of done it on a on a desktop machine. Um, so it turns out that a lot of ecologists try try to solve most of these problems on their desktop machines, and so one. So what tends to happen is um, here the parallel, the pair level parallelism is faster because you're taking advantage of the extra parallelism, um, you know. And if there are enough number of pairs, sorry, there's a typo. Enough number of pairs and the graph is large enough, this would be pretty, pretty good to use. But if, if let's say you're on a server class machine, uh, especially with multiple sockets, 
and multiple nodes, sometimes the, the broadcast cost tends to be pretty high. So, so the question is, how exactly do you re rearrange some of the computation so that it happens in the most efficient way? And that, that is something I'm still working on. So in, in, with regard to future work, I'll, I'll, I'll probably be working on the solver and, and, you know, and complementary, I'll be working with improving the parallel execution. Uh, and perhaps maybe I'll allow two parallel modes and allow the user to choose which one they want to use um, or not, d depending on how the experiments go. But I'm always looking for interesting applications, interesting collaboration. So if you guys have any, have an interesting use case for something like this, um, do feel free to check out the current pre-alpha version that's there at the GitHub repository. And do get in touch with me, and we can work together. Thank you.